So today we're going to have this uh, reading group from the Emergency Committee for Java. And the idea is that we're going to discuss uh, two materials. The first one is going to be um, two chapters uh, written by Meredith Tax uh, from her book, A Road Unforeseen, so I have it here. And um, we're going to discuss chapter five, Kurdish Women Rising, and also chapter number six, Democratic Autonomy in Turkey and Syria. So uh, that will be some of the material that we're going to discuss uh, tonight. The other material is a documentary uh, by Jenny Morai. She's the director of this documentary and uh, it's called Las Sandinistas. It's, this was released in 2018 and um, well, basically it's about women's participation during the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua between 1972 and 1992, 1993. Uh, today's reading group, today's reading session would be, the, the title would be Revolutionary Women in Nicaragua, 1972-1990, and Rojava, 2012-2020. So that would be the, the idea of, of, the, of the whole uh, reading uh, discussion today. Um, we are really happy that we, we have the participation of Holly Summer, who is going to comment on the, the Nicaragua uh, situation during those times and the documentary as well. And also uh, Meredith Tax, who is going to, um, to comment some of the aspects from uh, two of the chapters she wrote uh, on a, a road unforeseen. So the idea is that we're going to have uh, several moments of discussion. And uh, first of all, we're going to have like a moment for Meredith and for Holly to, to expose some of the ideas they want to share um, about these materials. Then we're going to have some moments to reflect about each one of the, of the materials. So the, re the, the chapters from the book, the documentary, and they're going to have, they're going to go open uh, some of, um, for a general discussion amongst us. Sergio asked me to start with why I wrote this. Um, so I will, and then I want to tell you a story. And uh, I wrote it because in 2014, I became fascinated by the women guerrillas in Rojava and the PKK when they rescued the Yazidis from Sinjar Mountain. And I had been doing different kinds of global feminist work since the late 80s, mainly with writers uh, working on gender-based censorship. And I had in my lifetime seen many armies of women guerrillas, China, Vietnam, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Nicaragua. But for some reason, I couldn't quite put my finger on these women seem different. And I wanted to find out why. So I began to do research. My research was limited because I didn't have any of the languages that were needed. Um, and also there was at that point almost nothing in English that had been published. Um, so I had to do it all online. But I persevered because as I went on, the subject seemed more and more important to me. How did these women get so strong? Why were they smiling all the time? How did they have so much validation from their own movement? Would they be driven back after a revolution as so many women guerrillas had before them, as the movie about Nicaragua says? Um, and to know the answer, I had to find out how they got to where they are. And that's a story I want to tell you because in my book, um, it's not in the chapter you have read. Uh, I'm assuming you actually read them. Um, and the book, it also intertwines the story of the women with other stories about ISIS and about uh, Kurds in Iraq. So I want to focus more on the women. And in this case, it won't be mostly uh, about women in Rojava, but about their predecessors in the PKK. And as I worked, I began to realize that one key uh, and the difference between them and uh, women in some of the other movements where they were driven back after the revolution is that from the beginning, the Kurdish women had 
who are conducting an intense struggle against sexism and machismo in their ranks. And particularly the struggle was very sharp in the armed struggle. They didn't give up and they didn't back down. And because the women guerrillas were so profoundly influential in the rest of Kurdish society, um, their example energized other women who were active in civil society. And these women then carried the struggle into parliamentary work. So um, at this point, the Kurdish women are recognized around, certainly around the Middle East as being somehow different, uh, more assertive, more out there, even by women like a woman I talked to from the labor movement in Turkey who said, I never knew exactly why, but the women from the Northeast always were different. Um, so the struggle against sexism continues, I am sure, although I don't know the details. And I want to tell you how it began, because it's not in the chapters you read. In the early 90s, there was a huge influx from the student movement into the PKK uh, as things began to open up a little in Turkey after a period of military dictatorship. One of the conditions of becoming a PKK guerrilla then and now is that you have to take a, a, a vow of celibacy, that you won't marry, that you will devote your life and your emotional life to the movement, become a bride of the revolution, as they used to call it in the old days. Um, and this is partly because of conditions in the Middle East are such that the only way girls could leave their families in most cases without uh, somebody feeling that they had to be killed to preserve the honor of the family was if it was guaranteed that they would remain pure and not sully the family. And Ochelin, uh, Abdullah Ochelin uh, was always in favor of the celibacy rule, but it was a tension within the PKK, especially with some of the other men commanders. Um, the PKK is based in northern Iraq and Kandil, and as it grew stronger in the 90s, the Kurdish parties in Iraq came under a lot of pressure from Turkey because Turkey was very nervous about PKK raids from Iraq into Turkey. And they wanted uh, Barzani in Iraq to make them move away from the Turkish border towards Iran. And the PK refu PKK refused to do it. And in September 1992, they organized a huge raid of hundreds of guerrillas into Turkey to do various kinds of armed propaganda and organizing. Many of these infiltrators were women. Many were new recruits. And um, there was already quite a bit of tension within the guerrilla movement about women, about women being soldiers. Some commanders thought it was inappropriate for women to do this. Some thought that the women weren't strong enough to deal with heavy weapons and, and violence. Some thought having them around would distract the men or make them soft. Some expected them to do the cooking and laundry as they did in the Sandinistas. And a guerrilla from that time named Fatma told a Yust Jongadan, a researcher in 2016, this is a quote. What we experienced in 1991, 1993, the big rise in women joining the revolution was at the same time a period when there was a big chaos within the organization. What came out from this chaos? This came out. For example, there was this Ahmed, that means the commander in Ahmed, whose name was Semdin Sakik. He said, there will be no women left in the army. I'm sending them all away. They can go to the cities. Nobody can turn women into candidates for the guerrillas because women spoil men, he said. The highest commander in Kandil at that time was Uchulun's brother, his little brother, Osman. And Osman has a record of opposing women's equality over many years. So under his leadership, the women got a month of training and then they were told to leave Kandil and infiltrate into Turkey to do political agitation. And 
many were arrested. They ended up in prison for years. And at the same time, this big infiltration push of 1992 upset Turkey so much that they put a huge pressure on Barzani, so much that he agreed to give them some Peshmerga to help Turkey invade Kandil and force the PKK to relocate to another camp on the border of Iran, Camp Zeli. And together they sent a force of 5,000 soldiers against Kondo, and Turkey also bombed them from the air. And this is at a time when most of the cadre were in Turkey. Those who remained were new recruits and were hopelessly outnumbered, and they started getting killed, more and more and more of them, and supplies began to run out. And at that point, Osman Ocalan decided he would negotiate with Barzani. And he gave Barzani everything he wanted. He moved all the surviving PKK cadre to Camp Zeli. I think I read somewhere that he also said that he, he used men, the fact that many were women as an excuse for this, but I can't document that. Now, at that point, one of the leading women cadre in Kondo was Sakina Kansas, yes. who had gotten out of jail and gone into the mountains and later in, at this point became a leader of the women's movement inside the PKK. And this movement had already started getting organized in Germany while she was in jail. But it first began now among the guerrillas at Camp Zeli, when the women guerrillas, probably under her leadership, called for an all Kurdistan Women's Congress to be held there. And the goal was to form an autonomous women's organization within the guerrilla movement. And this idea was backed by Abdullah Ocalan, but he, remember, he is in Damascus all this time. He can't communicate very quickly with anybody in Condil. There's no electronic communications, only the telephone or personal messages or writing. So it takes a long time for him to find out what's going on or for them to hear from him. Now, it's difficult now to find out information about what happened at this first Women's Congress because uh, nothing has been translated and also the record has been su suppressed. Osman Ocalan was still in command. He opposed the celibacy policy. He also, at a later point, wanted PKK women to dress like normal Kurdish women and cover their heads. Um, another of the leaders there named Mehmet Sener, who was later expelled, uh, also pushed for guerrillas to be able to marry. Now, if they had been able to form sexual relations, uh, apart from the problems this would create with getting new recruits because of their families, we would have had a kind of power dynamics we saw in the movie about the Sandinistas. Um, but here they are with these guys, you know, these very important male guerrillas and a Congress of women, mostly new recruits, where these men had a lot of influence, and the Congress ended up passing resolution calling for a change in the celibacy rule. And when Abdullah Ujjalan found out about this, he, uh, he canceled the Congress. Its resolutions have been expunged from the record, and Osman was calling for discipline. He tried, this is probably also because of the mess he made at Condo, tried to escape to Iraq, was caught, and ended up doing five months in a PKK prison. Now, according to Nezan Ustanda, the, uh, the Turkish researcher, the chaos that I referred to in the quote from Fatima was because at this time, there was a very weak central command and commanders tended to act like the leaders of bandit organizations and the women opposed this style of work. And this resulted finally in their deciding they had to form a separate women's army. And this became official PKK policy at the Fifth Congress in 1995, where they passed a long resolution about uh, the foundation of any revolution which seeks to create a new society and be victorious over the old society must have women playing significant roles. Um, the p potential of women who make up half of society in the service of revolution and their hidden and suppressed talents and intelligence in creating an entire society based on equality is the most humane and most radical characteristic of our revolution. Um, the head of the party, that's Ursuline, 
has given special attention to this under the motto, a step forward for the national liberation movement is also a step forward for women. And the most important step which our party has taken is the creation of a women's army. This army seeks to destroy all the characteristics and modes of conduct created by the status quo of class society. There it's not only of military significance that a women's army be created, but it's significant for all aspects of our movement. That was all part of the official resolution from the Fifth Congress that I just read. And um, I won't continue now. Uh, I'm gonna hand this over to Holly and Sergio, but the struggle between Osman's faction and the women's movement inside the PKK continued for many years and ended up in a split in the party in 2004. Thank you, Meredith. So in terms of historical context, I hope everyone got to see the film because it is really well made. So hopefully if you did not get the chance, you'll get a chance to um, later. But I wanted to start off giving a very brief historical context of this um, and just talking about resistance a little bit more broadly. Um, so Nicaragua is one of the countries that probably has like or is at least very cognizant of its history of resistance. There's um, an interesting documentation of this since the Spanish colonizers arrived. Um, so since like the 1500s, there are plays that have been put on to kind of mock um, the Europeans who arrived to Central America. One of them is called Guiwense, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, but the idea of resistance is a really important part of kind of the national um, narrative of Nicaragua. It was also the first nation to oust the U.S. Marines in the 1920s. Um, and then the events kind of leading up to what we see in the film start primarily in the 1960s when university students begin the National uh, Liberation Front, the Sandinista National Liberation Front. Um, the most intense fighting that happens before the Sandinista Revolution is in the latter part of the 1970s, which is where we really start to see um, these women become kind of incorporated into um, the Sandinista forces. The revolution kind of comes to fruition in 1979, and then throughout the 1980s, there's a series of kind of revolutionary projects that are attempted. Um, however, those are quite limited because of um, the war that is largely funded by uh, President Reagan. There's also a fair amount of Soviet funding there. Um, I've done a fair amount of research trying to figure out who gave more. Um, it's impossible to say at this point, but it does look very much like um, Reagan was the aggressor, um, if we're going to compare the two influences there. Um, there's also kind of an emphasis on Daniel Ortega, and since there's a lot of, of problems circling around Daniel Ortega right now, it's just worth mentioning that he was part of the original junta uh, that emerged from the Sandinista revolution, and then he was re-elected in 2006 and has been in power ever since because he changed the constitution and has um, brutally repressed any kind of opposition. Okay, so just that kind of tiny historical context. Um, I was just gonna have a couple of comments about the film and just open it up for discussion to see what everyone else thought was really notable about this and kind of what we can take comparatively as well, um, thinking about different um, movements of resistance and, and the role of women. So I first watched this with a 30 year old friend whose father had actually fought in the, uh, in the Sandinista revolution. And he was absolutely shocked to learn that women had a role at all. So there actually has been a fairly, <laughs> complete erasure of the role of women in this case. Um, but even on a more basic level, he was even shocked to see footage of the war at all because it is something that is regarded as a, like such a traumatic experience for so many people that it hasn't really been um, a focus of memory per se. So there actually haven't been that many projects inside Nicaragua to, uh, to kind of remember these things because they're so painful for so many people. Um, and especially because there was like this ideal of a revolution, but then it was so utterly devastated by everything that happened in the 1980s that it, it's painful for many reasons. Um, so that was the first time I saw this film. And I wanted to say a couple different points that I think are not necessarily emphasized in it that also kind of, that also need attention. Um, so the first thing is that besides emphasizing the role of women, in the case of Nicaragua, it's also really important to highlight the role of young people and rural farmers, the campesinos. And 
because they've always played a really important role in social and political movements. And it's really kind of those three groups um, that have taken leadership in times of social change, um, both in the Sandinista revolution and also now in the ongoing conflict. Um, I guess I should also make a caveat to say that the Sandinistas of the 1970s and 80s are not the same Sandinistas as today. They technically are, but the nature of the movement has changed so much that it is horribly frustrating for me to hear people, um, especially from left-leaning views, that, that try to sympathize with today's Sandinistas because it has nothing to do with what happened in the 1970s and 80s. So just to put that out there as well. Um, an interesting comparison that can be made, getting back to things that I thought that weren't really uh, made very clear in the film, is that, and this is hard to explain, um, 1970s and 80s, you see two armed parties fighting against each other. So there's some level of kind of le legitimacy that that kind of conflict has. Um, so you have the Sandinistas who are ousting the US backed dictatorship. Um, both are armed, and the Sandinista motto at that time was free homeland or death. So there was a very high stake in what was happening. Um, in contrast, today's generation that's protesting now Ortega, ironically, um, has insisted upon peaceful resistance, and so they have absolutely refused to take up arms, um, and they've changed that, that motto that used to be free homeland or death to free homeland and life which does a lot to kind of flip um, the focus of everything. And they've really just had such an admirable, admirable resistance um, from this peaceful place because they don't, I mean, the, the overarching thought is that they don't think that violence is going to accomplish much because this, they, they're kind of connecting this as a consequence of the violence of the 1970s and 80s. So like if we do the same things we did back then, we're going to have the same results and we're just going to continue cycling. That's the way that I've heard it. Um, expressed typically. Um, let's see. A couple other things, which I guess I didn't explain my connection to Nicaragua, which would have been a really great way to start. I lived in Nicaragua for five years between 2013 and 2019. Um, so I was there also when this for, when this uh, most recent sociopolitical conflict started for the first 13 months. Um, and something that's interesting about like what we see in the film of this erasure of women is that that also remains the same during this current crisis because a lot of the people who have been used as paramilitaries since 2018 are uh, historic militants but those are all men never ever seen a woman militant who has been remobilized in the last two years so i'm not sure why that would be that was actually something that came up the second time that i was watching the film that i really can't answer i'm not sure if it's because they were so um, detached from the movement by this time or because they were so alienated. I don't know if they were just simply not called to remobilize, were they reticent to do so? There's really no way of knowing at this point, but that was something that was interesting as well. Um, and just to reiterate, I think this was mentioned in the film, but Nicaragua now has the highest teenage pregnancy rate in Latin America. It also has a complete ban on abortion, so there's no way of um, even children, if they get raped, of um, terminating a pregnancy. It has the second highest income inequality after Brazil and the second poorest nation overall after Haiti. Um, so needless to say, there's um, a fair amount of development um, struggles there and just in terms of inequity and inequality as well. Um, and then I just really briefly wanted to say something about um, Meredith's book that kind of uh, stood out to me both in the example that she raises and also in the case of Nicaragua, and it's this idea that the inclusion of women is usually a pragmatic choice. Like, it's done when it's convenient, but it's only done for those reasons. And it made me think of how many traditionally marginalized groups have also been in that same position, um, whether you're looking at, like, sexual minorities or uh, ethnic minorities. Like, we, we bring people in whenever they're convenient, and then once they're no longer convenient, <laughs> Um, their needs and their rights are no longer uh, recognized. So I thought that was a really great point that maybe we could also discuss. But that's all I had. If there's any really specific questions, though, I'd love to try to answer them or, or investigate and get back to you all. I have a question about what you just said. You said in the recent paramilitary mobilization, you mean by the government? Or right. By so 
Yeah, so in April 2018, um, there were two kind of catalyzing events that sparked anti-government protests, in this case, anti-Ortega protests. And in response, Ortega mobilized both members of the Sandinista youth, who are very young um, people who have usually benefited materially from his presidency, and also historic militants, so people who are typically 60s or so. Um, in terms of age, who are still um, kind of faithful to the Sandinista regime. I have another question from you. Maybe you're a better person. You're a better person to answer this. So there's this erasure of history, and this the, these two generations who are fighting for the, the resistance in a very different way. And are they are the two generations in touch with each other? If this is a new generation, know the reality of the the past because while I was watching the farmer's um, granddaughter she didn't she was a kid but she didn't know what her grandmother did is that true of the entire country yes yeah, so it really varies um, in the case of my friend that I mentioned he despite being a 30 year old man with a 60 year old father who fought has no idea what he really did during the war he hears kind of like one-off stories and offhand comments about it but a lot of people don't really know what even their close family members have gone through so it is I think it really depends um it hasn't been taught systematically in schools and when it is taught anything about the 70s and 80s is is now from a very like patriotic or like pro Sandinista standpoint so they talk a lot about like the martyrs and they talk about um the U.S. as an imperialistic nation but they don't really talk about what it was really like to live in those years so it's it's very it's a very skewed narrative okay thank you sergio should we proceed with our plan would you like to introduce in the sec next section okay great so the idea guys is that basically we have two moments of discussion the first one, and first of all, I want to thank both Holly and Meredith for, for their presentations, for, their, um, for sharing their experiences and their knowledge about, about the topic. And basically the idea on, uh, in today's reading group is to have two moments. The first moment as a presentation, yes, and the second moment would be to focus on each one of the materials. So right now we're going to focus on chapter five, from A Road Unforeseen by Meredith Tax. And the idea is that right now, if we have any comment or question about the specific material developed through the chapter number five, then we would have another moment around 10, 15 minutes as well for the chapter number six on democratic autonomy. And finally, we're gonna have another moment to discuss about uh, the documentary. The idea is that by, by the end, we can reflect uh, about all the material together, how to try to make connections between the readings and the documentary as well. So um, shall we proceed with this idea? Would you like to add something? Okay, <laughs> so let's do it. Okay, guys, so uh, discussion uh, about chapter number five. So the title of this chapter is, um, the Kurdish women rising. And we have several topics related uh, with the experience of some of the first women militants uh, in this movement. So, um, I, don't, I, I would like to propose is if anybody has a comment or a question about these topics. I have some questions, but if, if anybody would like to, to start the discussion. It just came very interesting to me that the use of the word honor has been put in places where um, sexual relationships or uh, relationships between um, men and women were related. And the use of the word honor and the context that they were speaking, it just, it was a question because in my culture, when, when, when if someone is raped, we say the honor has been stolen. And you, you never get to hear that in, in, in the US, it's, it's rape, but over there it's honor. Why, why have the countries not 
come out of this context of honor why if why is the honor between a woman's legs or why has that continued so far and it's just the thought that i'm putting out there well first of all the I, I'm just going to, I don't know if you want me to answer or if we should all talk or, or what, um, but let me, let me start. Um, it's obvious that you're talking about Muslim countries, but this is not only true of Muslim countries. It's true in some Latin American countries as well. Um, for instance, uh, if a man is married to a woman and thinks that she's having an affair, uh, it, it is still legal in some places for her to for him to kill her or to kill her boyfriend to restore his honor um, and I think a lot of this is these are essentially tribal cost customs that have persevered through many centuries and are strongest in feudal cultures and agricultural countries and the countryside and so on. So for instance, this is still a big problem in lots of parts of Kurdistan. You know, people do get killed by their brothers or uncles or fathers, just as they do in Pakistan. Um, not in Rojava anymore. Nobody, I mean, anybody who did that would be in big trouble, certainly, or even tried but in Iraq, and I suspect in Iran, um, and, uh, and uh, in Turkey, I don't know, probably, I mean, in Turkey, the Kurds have many different political persuasions, so it would depend a lot on where and what family you were talking about. But um, tribal and family and clan uh, sexual relations are basically controlled by the tribal elders who are always men and the father of the family. And if you are a girl and want to do something different, marry the wrong person, marry somebody from outside your own ethnic group, run away and go to school, um, you are decreasing not only the honor of the family, but its potential to make profitable alliances with other families, um, to gather resources that can be used to help the boys. And because that's what a girl's job is, is to help the boys. And um, these are traditions in many parts of the world. And they go back to, you know, feudal and ancient customs. Jean sure. can probably say more about this than me. <laughs> I can't say much about this question in particular, but it does seem like it's part of a, a broader question of why are some people able to mm, distance themselves from traditional norms and, and take a different path. Like in the film, we see that Dora Maria's family taught her from the time that she was very little, which would have been a while ago now, <laughs> that women and men kind of had equality and that they could all fulfill the same roles and that these divisions in society exist but they're socially constructed and, and they're a bad thing um so i think it kind of does also raise that question of like in a larger way why are some people kind of like drawn towards that like difference in thought why are some people able to um i guess overcome like the the restrictions that tradition imposes. Sergi, would you want to continue? Yes, I have a comment on chapter number five. Um, and it's, it is quite interesting how the, the chapter as a whole starts uh, by presenting a small biography of a uh, Sakine Kansis. I don't know how to pronounce correctly the name of this militant. Uh, but uh, uh, that she was born in 1958. So I was like trying to, you know, I, I do not know I'm a, like a broader history of, of Turkey and, 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 and Kurdish communities in all of this region. But I was thinking about a, a, like this enormous 
a military operation that carried on the Turkish state in 1937-1938 in Dersim, I think, is the name of this region. So I was, I was reflecting about, for example, how was the experience of many of, of the people that were displaced during these, these military operations and how some of the children from this generation, they actually began forming these uh, study groups. And among those study groups, there, uh, there was Sakine Kansis and also Okalan as well. So it is, it is interesting to, like, to try to connect like several um, dimensions from, from the same phenomenon. The first one, these are the children from, from, this, uh, from this massacre. The second one, that uh, these Kurdish militants, they had access to education in important Turkish cities as well. And then uh, how they, one of the first steps uh, towards rebellion was basically leaving their family. So we can see how uh, the idea of, of Kurdish communities is, is a process that is like, you know, sometimes it's opening new communities, sometimes it's uh, gaining knowledge from their past in order to project. And uh, I found that really interesting. And also how uh, Meredith compares this situation with a whole movement that is happening globally uh, with women uh, during and after the Second World War as you, these women uh, guerrillas from Europe uh, to El Salvador and South Africa, Zimbabwe. So I found that interesting. And I just wanted to like to point out these two characteristics. One of the things that happens, and it's happened in the United States as well, and it's part of the history of immigration here, is that when people migrate from the countryside to the city, either as a result of some atrocity, some unbearable history in the place they come from, or simply for economic reasons or personal reasons, their culture changes and they become uh, more individualized. Uh, I, my first book was about uh, immigrants a lot in, in the labor movement and the socialist movement in the United States. And one of the people who impressed me very much, who I read about, was an immigrant from Russia named Abraham Bisno, who was a trade unionist in Chicago in the uh, 1890s. And he wrote about how the women from his family and his village, when they came to the United States, and these are women who had been completely subsumed in the family in the same way um, that we're talking about the Kurdish women or Pakistani women who would never have had any opportunity to do anything by themselves, would have been expected to marry somebody who their fathers chose or whoever was available and work probably because they were poor but would not have an individualized existence. They would be part of a family. That was their, their existence was their family. And um, how suddenly when they were here and they were alone, even if they had come with their families, they started thinking of themselves in a different way because they would go out to work and they would have a little money, not very much, but it was their money and they, could give some or all to their family, or they could keep some back for themselves. And that gave them a kind of sense of themselves as individuals that they never could have had in the old country. And I think that some of these people inevitably become radicals because they are intelligent people who respond to the oppression of their times. And this may add to further breaches with their family because most families are not like the, the Nicaraguan women who, who we saw in the film, who's, who were very supportive of her work. And that's one reason that the Kurds had this celibacy rule, because uh, they, want, they wanted the women who were becoming guerrillas to be honored and admired, not thought of as whores. And they would have been thought of as whores had they contracted the kind of extramarital arrangements that led to children and so on that we saw in the movie about the Sandinistas. 
Anybody else has a comment or a question for chapter five? So yes. Um, um, yes, in in chapter five, I um, I see there's an inevitable dichotomy between uh, revolution and love, which is a dichotomy that I kind of uh, grew up with. Um, you know, it's um, my parents' generation grew up in China in the socialist time. Also, the whole legacy of the socialist uh, cultures always re re reinforced this, um, this uh, love and revolution are always incompatible. Every movie uh, from the socialist time are also s talking about how women have to subsume their romantic interests into the uh, uh, a larger goal of, of uh, defending the nationhood. Um, now that I don't really recall uh, or uh, any, uh, or for example, Marxist's writing about institution of marriage, but um, um, I, I think I find the ending of that section on the rise of uh, Kurdish women is a tone, I, I, I detected that there's slightly a tone of kind of accusing a Western or maybe a, a, a liberalist way of uh, emphasizing sex as a token for individual freedom. Um, I, 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 uh, I felt that's a, um, hinted by that uh, example of that, um, uh, uh, what was his name, I forgot, uh, someone who posted on Reddit who claimed himself has been transformed uh, by working with women uh, soldiers that uh, he also enjoyed this um, relationship without having to worry about sexual relationship. But then he also ended on Janet Bell's interview with, uh, who was it, um, uh, that says, you know, it is still very important for the women's organization in uh, Rojava to, to, to not have sex before marriage. I wonder what would be um, maybe your, your your personal thoughts about about this tension. Seems to yeah, be I think it, it is a real tension, and I'm I'm glad you brought it up. And I've tried to talk about it with people from the movement, and the the line, the political line of the PKK led women's movement is that. This is, it's very much like what you say. It's, it's what Freudians would call sublimation. That, you know, everything, all your emotional energy should be poured into love of the people or love of the movement. And that this is, this is the highest calling that anyone can have, male or women. Um, I have problems with that. Uh, but of course, I'm a Westerner. And so, uh, and, and living in the indulgences of a large urban metropolis. And my generation of radicals was very much one of cultural revolution where our rebellion was to say, oh, you wanna control our sexuality, daddy? Well, lots of luck, you know? We have birth control now. You'll never even know what we're doing. Um, and, you know, that was very much the women's movement I came out of, is that we would own our own bodies. No man or no parents or no social censors would tell us what to do. And, of course, that led to all kinds of other things, like the emergence of the gay movement for many and so on. Or, and, you know, this is, but this has also been a characteristic of urban radicals, uh, always, you know, especially the men who would push it, you know, free love because there wasn't any birth control in those days that you could completely rely on. So it was much more risky for the women. But um, I think it's a, it's a contradiction inside the society of Rojava. I don't think you can permanently ex suppress sexuality. On the other hand, they don't expect people to be celibate unless they are cadre. I mean, this is not something that's expected of, you know, people who run for parliament or people who are working in their local neighborhood organization. It's only when they join 
the party that they are expected to give up any prospect of a family life. And I also wonder what they are left with when they're old. And if the relations of the party are strong enough to sustain them when they can no longer do the work or, or not. And I simply don't know. I, I have a lot of questions about this myself. Mm. Other people must have something to say about this. One second. Rose raised her hand. Rose, would you like to say something? Oh, one second. I need to un unmute you. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Hi. Um, I'm feeling, yeah, a contradiction about it, being someone who's not straight and has just come out as gay. And I feel like my, you know, the where I'm, how I was brought up by other feminists and my own influences and leftist influences, I'm like, wait a minute, that is kind of messed up because some people, you don't know their whole life and people should have those rights. But at the same time, I see that on one end and on the other end, I'm interested to know about the availability of contraception. It has something to do with trying to make the revolution actually happen and to make sure that people don't, aren't, you know, things aren't like behind because if people are having kids, that kind of thing. And at the same time, I also see just with people's family ties that there is things that people are rebelling against and changing, but it is a way to also let people know that they are willing to lift everyone up and help sustain their family. So I see, and I also, I have no idea what it's like to be over there and what the YPJ or YPG is doing. So I respect it. And at the same time, I see, I see some issues with it. I think we have to remember in their case, and also in the case of Turkey, that essentially they're at war, that they are living in the middle of a war, that they are going to be attacked at any moment, so that normal life is not a possibility no matter what. So it, it makes it easier to defer certain questions or to say, I will give this up because I must defend myself and my people or my village or whatever. Now, if peace should come, that will be an interesting situation. What will happen to these, these ideas? I wish I thought it would happen. <laughs> like there are different intersectionalities that are at play overhead which if they, we think about the second wave of feminism which which were basically the fight for liberation um, the, the things that you talked about they were they were in a different context but I, I guess maybe I'm sorry just just while thinking about it one other difference that I found out up uh, I noticed was whenever I see the female fighters from Rojava, I, I haven't seen a cigarette in their hands so far in the pictures. Maybe I, I haven't noticed it really, but when I was looking at the last San, uh, Sandinistas, uh, they were holding cigarettes. Like maybe these were these were the times when Edward Bernay was uh, perhaps advertising uh, cigarettes as torches of freedom, and maybe the being close to the U.S. and they were having the influence of the feminist. Uh, cigarette, females uh, holding cigarettes, but I never see that. I haven't seen that so far with um, Rojava fi female fighters. I guess there's multiple intersectionalities which they ha they have to account for, which the feminists here in the US uh, they didn't have to face, and we don't really know about that. When I was in China in 1973. Everybody was smoking, except the women didn't smoke very much. I mean, all the men smoked, like constantly, chain smoke. Some of the women smoked, but not most. And I asked them, um, how come you're all smoking? Don't you know about lung cancer? And they laughed and they said, oh, you believe that? That's really funny. I was just going to comment that I've never seen a Nicaraguan woman smoke and so when I saw that on the film I was it also stuck out to me as well well they probably have learned about lung cancer since the movie you know? well uh, plenty of the men still smoke so it's a, a gender difference there mm. Sergio do you have anything else on this chapter um I think we can continue with the next chapter and then if we have another idea about chapter number five we can retake it by the end of the well by the 
conclusive, conclusive part. Yeah, excellent. So chapter six, uh, remind me, what's the title? Democratic Autonomy, right? Yep, Democratic Autonomy. Uh, I'll just ask, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions about that specific chapter? I guess I just had a really quick question. Um, I know this is alluded to um, briefly here about why this the the system that's fairly similar to what's happening in, in northeast Syria didn't pan out as well in Turkey, and that's because of just the continual continuous repression by the state. I mean, could you talk a little bit more, or could somebody talk a little bit more about what specifically has led it to be so difficult there? Is it just constant like physical attacks, or are they undermined in some way? Well, Anya can speak to this better than I, but certainly the uh, the wave of repression that started uh, around 2015 has focused a lot on women and uh, on the, you know, they set up co-mayors, uh, co uh, one male, one female, and co-heads of all civil society organizations in the parts of Turkey that the, they were strong in that the movement was strong in, and they um, and the Turkish government just can't stand it. They can't stand the idea that some cities would have a woman and a male uh, co-mayor, and so they keep arresting all the mayors. Um, they the minute the repression started, and the repression started a lot because of Rojava. I mean, the success of the experiment in Rojava and their ability to start really practicing autonomy freaked Turkey out so that they wanted to crush it in their own country before it got any farther. And they saw how people were uh, inspired by the freedoms that the people in Rojava were seizing. And so, I mean, they every, every time the uh, the government seizes a village or a city and says, we're putting your mayors in jail. Your mayors are all, you know, illegal. The woman is illegal. And they disband all the women's organizations. The last thing they want uh, in, in this Islamist government that is now ruling Turkey is, uh, is female autonomy or any kind of self-organization. Anya, you, surely you can say more about this. Yeah. Um I went to Diyarbakir in 2018 and I really, really wanted to talk to the people who were involved in these local structures and communes and um, workshops, cooperatives, and it was almost impossible to find them uh, after this brutal oppression of 2015, 2016. It was basically a military operation that raised like half of uh, towns uh, to the ground and uh, a lot of people were killed and uh, displaced and there was still fear in 2018, um, two years afterwards. And they also closed down all this uh, local, um, any, any type of uh, local uh, initiatives, be it uh, a cooperative or uh, communes. There were these uh, people's houses for communes to meet, right? So for, for the people of a neighborhood to meet. And they, they were, so the movement was cooperating with the mayors from the movement that were elected in the cities. Uh, so they provided basically these people's houses for the people. And uh, after this uh, um, military operation, even houses were shut down. Uh, so there was no space, people were scared. Um, it became illegal. Uh, there are still some initiatives uh, that went underground and they're still functioning. And of course, activists are still uh, um, mobilizing, organizing in electoral politics, but the most important, the involvement of people, uh, the mass uh, movement, uh, that has subsided, basically because of this uh, brutal oppression. Anyone else on this specific chapter? If not, I can throw in a, a question or a comment. Um, so in the end of the chapter, Meredith goes into the discussion of economy and how women were made, I mean, were given uh, 
space in the discussion of uh, uh, an alternative economy. So I thought we could discuss the inter the intersection of uh, patriarchy and economic oppression and how the movement approached this intersection. What specific uh, uh, initiatives were done to uh, help women economically and why was that important? Sorry about the phone. That's okay. The whole, the whole idea is to draw women into socialized production. You know, this is a classic socialist idea, that you don't want women stewing alone in their house, doing nothing but childcare and cooking and cleaning, because that removes them from political life. You want them to be in a social atmosphere where they have contact with other people and, um, and can start getting political education and you want them to be able to earn a little money because that gives them more power in the family. So those are the basic reasons, I think. This is very common in socialist revolutions in general. They almost always do this. I have a comment. Um, Yes, and it's related both from chapter number five and six. So I was wondering, uh, Meredith, you were saying that by 1994, 1985, there was like a, this chaos within the PKK. And through this chaos, there was the possibility of building a new relationship of women or, or, and even a, a women's army in, in the PKK. So I was wondering as well, how is this change of, is, is it related? That, for example, we, we see an increasing numbers and quality of, part, of women's participation in the movement, but at the same time that a other kind of, a, let us say, a violent actions by the PKK, such as suicide bombers, that start, starts to change, isn't it? So is there a relationship with the kind of war that the PKK is developing by the end of the 1990s? And also the this the emergence of the of women's movement within the PKK. You're asking, does this lead to suicide bombers? No, no, no. My question is, how the PKK transformed the way it's a it was defining revolution. Yes, how they before they had this perspective of, of even using the suicide bombers. And they, they they started to change towards a more communal kind of revolution by the by the end of the 1990s and, and the beginning of the 2000s. So, how do we understand this change between the way the PKK directed the war, but also the emergence of a new historical subject, both communal and feminine? So, I was wondering about it. I mean, the suicide bombers, frankly, is something I have trouble with and don't understand um, well. I, I, I think it, it and, and you know, there was a huge wave, especially of women's suicides um, after Ochelin was uh, uh, arrested, you know, as, as a form of protest. And this, this seems to be a cultural thing. And women's suicide is fairly common in Iraqi Kurdistan as well, particularly when faced with a forced marriage. But I don't, I, I can't fit it in to my understanding of the other changes. I don't know if it's a, a false road or if it's just something I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But certainly, um, beginning in the 90s, uh, Ochelon began to emphasize the need. I mean, I think, you know, after 1989, and the complete dissolution of the um, what they used to call really existing socialism with all its faults. You know, it became obligatory for people to think about it and to criticize it. And th the Kurds had always been, uh, the, Kurd the PKK had always been more independent than most um, Marxist movements that I ever saw. 
in, in that time because most of them would line up with either Russia or China, um, depending partly on where they would get help uh, or Cuba in the, in, the, in the case of Latin America, but that was connected to Russia. Occasionally you'd have somebody lining up with Albania, but that didn't happen very much. And, um, and the Kurds didn't do that. They, they would not declare fealty to either one of these two contending giants in the socialist camp, and they were fairly critical of uh, the repressive tendencies in really existing socialism. And after 1989, they just started saying so all over the place, um, uh, led by Ocalan saying, this is not freedom, this is not what we wanted. Well, why did they, I mean, we're not to end, and Ocalan decided it was the state the state was the problem. Making a fetish out of a national state was not the way forward. And he went back and he developed most of these ideas after he was, I mean, he had had the beginnings of them before, but only after he was in jail and had time to really read and study did he start writing about it. And um, in his writing, you see, he identifies uh, the subordination of women with the creation of an absolutist state as part of the same historical process and wants to get back to before the state and resurrect the power of women as a way to build a different kind of road forward. Now, all this Neolithic history is very speculative, let's say. I mean, I don't, I mean, there are a few anthropologists who agree that this is, you know, nobody has done much work on this basically in academia uh, since the 1920s and 30s. <laughs> so this is stuff that still has to be thought through in terms of the actual history and to the degree that anybody can actually find it out, which is pretty small anyway, because there weren't any written documents from the Neolithic period. But, um, but as a vision, it's persuasive. As a mythology, it's appealing. And um, the idea that women and men should have equal power in the society is a lot of what powers this movement, I think. That and the idea that the action is local, that you build up from the bottom that the action is cooperative, that the action has to be in harmony with the environment, are all ideas that are very appealing to us, I think, now. Anyone else? There are some people who haven't spoken yet. I guess I'm curious about how the Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK, Obviously, they're very strongly connected to the Democratic Union Party, to the revolution in northeastern Syria. Um, but I'm just a little bit curious if it could be elaborated on a little bit more how um, the PKK, which had already existed, helped like strengthen Rojava and how that connection like was of mutual benefit, I guess. Because obviously, they're two different groups of people. Like they're not they're not synonymous, though they are closely linked. And so I'm just a little bit curious in the immediate development of the revolution in Rojava um, when it first happened, how the existence of this previous organization that had struggled with the Turkish state, how that, you know, is a mutual benefit. Um, any thoughts on that I'd, I'd be interested in? Ocalan lived in Damascus for most of his working life. Most, I mean, he couldn't live in Turkey. He would have been put in jail immediately. So a lot of the, uh, the re because he was there, even though they, didn't do any work inside of Syria because they would Syrians would have kicked him out. A lot of Syrians were attracted to the PKK, a lot of Syrian Kurds, and about 20% of the membership of the PKK was Syrian. Now, in the 90s, and especially after Ocalan was uh, arrested, and I don't remember the exact date of this, the PKK devolved into a different kind of organization. They, at least in theory, stopped being a democratic centralist Marxist-Leninist party and became a network of separate 
national or separate parties, one in Iraq, one in Iran, one in Turkey, and one in Syria, who were all had the same ideology, but had their own leadership and were part of, they were part of the same network. They would go to conferences of this um, Kurdish uh, confederation, um, but they were not under the control of the PKK anymore. So they had their own leadership and they have, the Rojava leadership has on occasion actually disagreed, um, particularly in terms of Syria with some of the directions coming from the PKK and have taken a different direction, especially in relation to the US and uh, the question of what would happen during the last Turkish invasion. And, uh, but they all do, they always say it's the ideology that unites us. It, and they all have a strong attachment to Ocalan as the source of this ideology and as their leader. And they have pictures of him all over uh, Syria as well as, I guess they can't put his picture up in Turkey. But Anya, can you say more about that, having been there in Turkey? I mean, the people with whom I interacted, for them, it's basically one movement, honestly. <laughs> I mean, yes, institutionally it is different, but it's the same people with the same aspirations and the same ideology. And there is a, this um, interaction between borders, I mean, at least until the borders were closed from Turkey to, to Syria. But uh, in the people's perceptions, uh, it's one. And you mentioned earlier, they take isp um, inspiration, people in Turkey, Kurds in Turkey since their um, initiatives, uh, since their attempt to construct this new vision was suppressed there, they see the continuation of this initiative in Rojava and they see hope uh, for themselves uh, in Rojava. Can I ask if people from Turkey try to get, get to Rojava or is it impossible? Well, it became impossible by the time I got there in 2018. That was impossible at that point from Turkey. You had to go through Iraq. Okay, I think we may move on to the discussion of the film and then if there are any questions about the book left, we will discuss in the very end. Is that good? Yeah. To talk, do you need to raise your hand here? Or? No, go ahead. It's just 12 of us, so. Sorry. Um, yeah, I thought um, also, you know, a very interesting point to, uh, about democratic autonomy and the construction of these uh, institutions uh, uh, in Syria, at least, this is how um, the concepts of uh, democratic and federalism are coming to uh, the Arab areas. Um, because they're having to rely on these institutions, they're having to participate in these institutions. Um, so, you know, I, so, there, there are a lot of, um, you know, party cadre that come and, and participate in helping set up these institutions and they're there and they're present. And, um, it's important in the spread of the ideology, so to say, you know, because um, it's one thing to talk about, you know, people that have been participating in the movement in Kurdish areas for uh, 15 years or more, or, you know, um, for folks that have been participating in the revolution for the last five years or less, you know. Um, and that's, you know, when you're talking about what Rojava is now, it, you know, you have to really take a, take a hard look at the two different groups of folks um, to see where, to understand where, which direction it's going to go in the future. Um, we just thought some thoughts. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll go ahead with the third the movie, the documentary that we watched. And there's, there's a lot of similarities and comparison that we can make from, uh, with the movie and, uh, and Meredith's work. But 
what came to me as a surprise was this was the debut, the first debut of the director Jenny Murray. I believe that's her name, and this is her first do documentary. In the work that she's done, it's it's pretty much very incredible and I was surprised where she got the footage from because um, it's very close footage of the female leaders she's following but just apart from that I would like to throw in very general questions because Holly did cover the basic points that did come across and I was about to point to them but just generally speaking what's your thinking on the role of students in student activism because that's played a major role in all of the different evolutions of, from Argentina, other Latin American countries in Bangladesh and US. Student activism has played a great role, but it's also frowned upon with students getting engaged too much politically and leading to um, further problems in politics. Just general perception uh, I would like to start a discussion on this what's your opinion especially in context of Nicaragua and um, Rojava is is there anything you'd like to what's what's your opinion on um, this the importance of student activism I think it's vital I mean, it's the heart and the spark that lights many movements. Um, I was a student activist myself during the Vietnam War. That's the time in people's lives when they're thinking. They have to use their brains. You know, they are not yet completely overwhelmed by children and work and having to make a living and cleaning a house and all the other stuff that comes up later and so they have a chance to make a break with the way they were raised or to continue it if they come from a political family and um, and to see what they think needs to be done to make a just society. Students are wonderful. And then there comes the question of third party mediation or US interfering into other people's uh, other countries um, affairs and this has been a very contested um, work because historically it's been um, countries have accused us i believe nicaragua also had a case against us for the contras um, and there's been arguments again against it but then in certain cases us is needed to intervene like in case when we wanted turkey us to uh, put pressure on Turkey to stop um, att the attack on Rojava in the recent uh, few mo uh, few months. Where do you mark the line between? Um, it's it's a very tricky question and it's very contextual. I understand, but what where do you like draw a line between third party in intervention or just U.S. intervening in other countries' matters and basing it off on things like? the war against communism or in other contexts, other regions. So something that stuck out to me, having had to do a fair amount of research recently on this very situated in Nicaragua at a very specific time, was not even the role of the US per se, but the role of Reagan. Like you're really, there's so much evidence from the time in the 1980s that Reagan was acting almost alone. He had to beg Congress to approve the funds. He went against almost all of the diplomats that were telling him the Soviet Union does not want to invest in Nicaragua because Cuba is expensive. They don't think the country is ready for a real revolution. Like they, they are not pushing this as hard as you think they are, as hard as you act like they are. But it it really does feel like this like one man agenda in the case of, of Nicaragua in the 80s. Um, and so I think that's another like thing of how, how do we weigh that then? Because it's really not even the government of one country going against the other. It's this one person wanting to intervene. So I think it's also an issue of how do we try to, how can we tamper the ability of that one head of state? How do we, and I don't know if that also goes kind of like the same as like Erdogan, but yeah, I don't know. That makes me think of that. Well, I think in today, I mean, I, even in 1980, I think Reagan had his his own clique, you know, people like Elliot Abrams and so on, who were hardcore neocons, and they 
they may not have been in the majority, but they were in the seat of power. Um, but today, when we talk about external intervention, it's not just the US. I mean, look at Syria, look at all the people or the countries that have intervened in Syria. Um, and then it becomes a situation where Rojava, say, would like to be in the position of being able to play one off against the other to create some space. But this is very difficult and challenging because you don't know what the others are going to do, you know, so they're constantly trying to figure out how they can work Russia to get what they want and how they can use the U.S. against Russia and will it be more advantageous to them if the U.S. stays or if the U.S. goes and how much control do they have over that anyway. And, you know, I think what we have to do is listen to them and support what they say they need rather than say, as some on the left do, they're damned to the eternal hell of socialism because they accepted aid from the US when they should only have accepted aid from Russia, you know, or something. Uh, this is, we have to take our lead from the people whose politics are most like what we aspire to. I think. I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of adding on to Cher's question, then what is also the place of organizations like the UN? Like, do we think that nations have a prerogative to intervene or to s step in in some way, even if it's not direct intervention? Or should that also, or should that be um, something that's only done by these international organizations or both? And then how do we also factor in the power that certain nations have in those organizations. The UN is nations. The UN is a confederation of states. It is not a confederation of peoples. So we first have to recognize that, that, you know, it is limited, it is limited, <laughs> limited, uh, sorry, by its foundation being states, some of which are by the constitution of it much more powerful than others. So it is a very flawed instrument and it has gotten weaker and weaker in the last 20 years. I mean, it was, in the 90s, it was much more powerful and respected than I think it is now. And that's partly because of the US, but it's also partly because of Russia and partly because of China and partly because of all kinds of other things. And because it doesn't ever have enough money and it doesn't have the authority to impose its will. So the UN Rapporteur on Human Rights will say, da, 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 and then nobody will do anything. So I think ultimately in the new world that we are going to need to create after this virus spends itself, we're gonna need a more powerful international instrument than the UN or the UN is gonna to have to change and actually have some power. And I don't know how that's gonna happen, but there are so many things that are unknowable at this point. That's only one of them. One other thing that I would want us to talk about is, especially in case of Nicaragua is um, the Sandinistas, how after after the revolution and what happened to the leaders, how they were erased, their, his, their work was erased, their struggle was erased. Despite that, they're willing to come back and they have the same morale, like more, um, like Dora Maria. Um, a, a rational person, a third person, looking as a third person, um, how, why haven't they still lo lost the morale? I, I still couldn't get, get I, I know they're passionate about what, what they do. But is there any specific reason as to why their morale and why are they still so optimistic? They sounded optimistic about it. It's it's just a general thought. Oh, I thought about that from a different angle. Uh, I feel like for women, for these women in the film, it's an unfinished revolution. And you know, not simply a revolution that was crushed by the United States 
but uh, non-Finnish revolution for women specifically, who even without US intervention, they were not given the space that they you know, deserved with their lives fighting in, before the Sandinistas came to power. There was not a single woman on the presidential council at the beginning of the revolution or at any time after that. Not yeah. even one. Yeah. I mean, that's really something. I mean, most revolutions would have at least put a couple of women on there. You know, maybe somebody's sister or wife who was already powerful, but not well, even. Not Rosario. <laughs> Yeah, it was Sorry, Rosario terrible, wasn't terrible even joke, on but... it then. You know, in the beginning, she wasn't, she wasn't even on it. She was too busy shopping. Um, I was just going to chime in that this is actually fairly related to the topic of my thesis. So I'm looking at the motivation of people who are protesting, of, of Nicaraguans who are protesting in New York and New Jersey. And a lot of this kind of does tie in because many of them migrated to the US as 15 and 16 year olds who were avoiding the military draft in 1984. Um, and they do also have kind of what Anya is talking about of this like feeling of irresolution. Like they, they say like, we couldn't, you know, combat Ortega then, but now we can. <laughs> so there is this kind of feeling of, it's not just that, there's a lot of things that play into this. Um, it's very, it's actually more complex than you'd think. But, um, I think a lot of it kind of does come down to this feeling of, okay, now we, now we can. Um, and I was also going to tag on the film for whatever reason did not mention this. I'm not sure if it was produced right before this happened. Um, but Dora Maria is also a minority in Nicaragua because she's lesbian. Um, and she had a partner from Costa Rica, Ana Quiros, and Ana Quiros is also a feminist. Um, and in 2018, um, well, the Sandinistas hate Dora Maria absolutely like hate Ortega hates her he would probably assassinate her if it weren't such a big deal um but as soon as the protests broke out in 2018 what they did was they deported Ana Quiroz because she's a Costa Rican although she'd been living in Nicaragua for 20 years to try to kind of debilitate uh, Dora Maria so they've successfully targeted her on um, many accounts I was just going to add that because that was not accounted for in the film so what happened? Are they, is she able to have any kind of relationship with her now? Or is it I'm not sure if they're together. That wasn't really, I mean, that, the newspapers, unfortunately, don't, you know, usually follow through on this type of things. But I don't think she's allowed back into the country. Yeah, so I'm assuming she probably travels. But that's also difficult because Dora Maria could be um, apprehended by the immigration authorities because she's blacklisted, as the film was stating. Yeah, I was sort of wondering about that, because um, it said that she was listed as uh, a terrorist. Is she, like, able to be in the public spotlight at all? Like, it seems like she's obviously doing advocacy. Yeah, so this is also, so most of the people in the film, except for Claudia, who was the one who had the cute little granddaughter, I believe, and um, was out in the country, um, everyone else is high class. They are about the 5% of Nicaraguans in terms of socioeconomic class. So that should also, I guess, be highlighted. Um, so they have a certain degree of invulnerability because of class that doesn't always work, but they're much less likely to get thrown into jail than people who don't have their same privileges. Um, I don't know that she, she doesn't go out in the public as much as she used to. Um, but yeah, everyone's blacklisted if they think that you are against the government for any reason. So there's two different types of surveillance. Sorry, I'm gonna go on a little tiny soapbox. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> there's two different types of surveillance um, in Nicaragua. One of them is through the citizen power councils, which you know sounds really great until you know that it's a neighborhood surveillance system through which the government keeps um, track of everyone and their political affiliations. So like in 2018, when the protests started, the citizen power council people they have one in each street of each neighborhood in nicaragua would be watching and writing down the people who came and went um before the protests and after the protests and so those people would then be persecuted and harassed um by the state and then they also kind of amplified surveillance via social media so through social media and through these neighborhood councils they started making blacklists and it's a very vague concept like it's very difficult to figure out if you are blacklisted i don't think i am right now 
but I've done some things recently that might make that decision. Um, not a huge deal if you're a foreigner because you have the privilege of not being there and of having a, a, a nationality that isn't Nicaraguan. But if you're in Nicaraguan and you get blacklisted, it really depends. Like again, the class is a certain protector, but there have also been plenty of people from the middle and upper classes who have been um, killed and jailed as well. Um, and then sometimes the state will just wait until you come in direct contact with them. So you could be pulled over for a parking ticket and you actually get taken to jail because you're on the blacklist, but you weren't as high of a priority to, you know, drag you out of your house at midnight. So it really, it really depends. So Holly, can I ask you a couple of questions? First of all, um, are you in touch with any of the people who were in the movement? Not with them. I'm in touch with mostly middle-class people. I mean, I, I, I did my bachelor's degree in Nicaragua and so the people I went to school with were probably of that like top, top socioeconomic tier. But most of my kind of friendships and, and colleagues have been middle-class. So I do have lots of feminists in that, that group though. But none of those, you know, I don't want to say big wigs, but yeah, uh, none of those top players, I guess. And the people you said who are here now in New Jersey and New York, what do they actually do? do they yeah, have any so the organization that I mostly work alongside is called the SOS Nicaragua Committee. And up the until what? recently, the they SOS Nicaragua Committee, but they only have sources in, in Spanish, so I'm not sure you'd be able to read too much about them. I continue my thesis when it's done. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but they do a lot of in-person kind of protest demonstrations, symbolic type things like um, to commemorate those who've passed away. They'll do things in front of the Nicaraguan consulate. We did an event on Brooklyn Bridge once. Um, some of them are also cultural events to try to kind of build cohesion among the Nicaraguan diaspora because there's a lot of different opinions in terms of uh, within the opposition and there's a lot of division about um, what kind of approaches should be taken and such right now and the opposition is hoping that they can bind themselves together because there are supposedly elections happening in 2021 but it's uh it's mostly to try to have community cohesion and also to a limited extent to uh, educate I guess the public about what's happening in Nicaragua. Yeah, we saw we saw them flyering when the movie first came out a few years ago at, at a film forum. Yeah, they're really great. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And it's an interesting mix of people who mostly came in the 1980s. Um, so they're a little older and then people about my age, um, between like 20 and 30, who have recently had to um, seek asylum in the US because they've been persecuted for their political activities. But there's a very low number, comparatively, in the U.S. There's 80,000 who have sought asylum in um, Costa Rica. And then I'm not sure of the U.S. The U.S. doesn't really provide that kind of data. The U.S. isn't exactly an open door. I mean. Yeah, not so much. Uh, Zoe, you have, you have a question? Yes. Sorry, yes. Yeah, I, it's kind of related to what Holly was saying. Um, um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, when I was watching the film, I was also wondering about the kind of class distribution of all the women participants. L like, you, like we can see some of them are look more fancy in, um, than others. Um, I wonder were any of the uh, middle class women were also making a big part of that? My impression is that no. Um, so Diaconda Veli, who is the one with the really curly hair, she's very artistic and very, I want to say out there, but that's how she would probably be described in Nicaragua. Um, she's internationally known for her poetry. She's lived in different places in Europe. She's fairly well off. So is Dora Maria. Um, although not to the same, they're obviously very different people. Yeah, everyone else who was profiled except for Claudia, the middle class in Nicaragua is very small to begin with, and so it, it's hard to, to find people. Um, I can try to see if some of my middle class people have written anything and pass on their contacts, though, if that's of interest to anyone. But I'm, I'm assuming most of those are in Spanish. But um, Would you say uh, Claudia uh, is a rare exception that she's kind of from more of a rural background? 
a rare exception in terms of um, uh, in that uh, formation of female fighters. You know, I'm not. I'm not actually sure. I would think that that was not rare. I would think that it would have been more common for people from the middle and lower class to join than upper class, um, unless they saw some kind of ability to position themselves. But that's me making an assumption mostly. So I, I'm not sure. Thank you. Just in terms of like general class formations, though, that is the main dividing line in Nicaragua. Like it isn't, most people are of the same like ethnicity per se. Um, like it isn't in like Guatemala where there's a huge issue between like the indigenous and uh, the mestizo uh, Ladino population. Um, it's much more in terms of like class. So the first division I usually like think of in terms of class and then there's gender and then there's if you're from a rural or urban place. But class is definitely like the the main dividing line. Like I went to school with some people who would refer to their um, their maids as being of a different race because of their class, even being of the same like actual like race ethnicity, but they would kind of draw that same like, like there's a huge barrier we can't communicate. There's this, um, you know, boundary that we can't cross because we're just that different. So class really is a, a huge dividing line. <laughs> Giacomo the Valley wrote this awesome book that I highly recommend. Uh, the Country Under My Skin. I guess it's like backwards. But yeah, I know we can see it. We can see it. I I would be interested in trying to get in touch with somebody. In fact, um, Dora Maria is on Facebook. I just tried to friend her. We'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I probably shouldn't do that. I do have a really good friend who, maybe I should say this, maybe I shouldn't, I'll be really vague, <laughs> who has helped kind of provide um, some help to the opposition and is also a young feminist. She's, I guess my age, she might be 26. Um, if anyone's interested in contacting also like a, a younger person who has um, assumed the new challenges of feminism and the last couple yeah. of years. Well, I would, I mean, I don't have a seat. I'm never going to go there. So it doesn't matter to what I do. My wife says, although she doesn't want to be on the video chat, that, that, uh, Monica, Monica, who? Oh, She's also, on the also very active on Facebook and does, offers a lot of critiques of the regime. What is her name? Monica Baltorano. Okay. Her her brother was also just arrested for demonstrating. Yeah. Right. I don't know. I saw her in the movie. She's in the movie. Yeah, yeah, she's in the movie, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If anyone has anything else to add, please do. I have a comment uh, and it's related with for example, I remember I in two thousand four I I went to, to Nicaragua and um, I, I was born in Guatemala and we didn't know like, uh, you know, there were not many books about what, ha what happened in Nicaragua and El Salvador. So um, in a certain moment with a, together with a friend, we were like 21 years old back then, we decided to go to Nicaragua. So we take a bus and we went to, to Managua and Granada. And one of the first things that I noticed is First of all, this was 2004. That was before uh, Daniel Ortega returned to power. So it was like all the Sandinista imagery was in total decay. And even then, I took a lot of pictures then. I wanted to, to you know, to try to, to, to see what happened with the revolution in that moment. And what I do remember is that uh, there were many monuments. And I would say that many of them, if not all, were focusing a uh, male guerrillas, guerrilla fighters. That, that's one thing. The second thing is that in the books that I read during those years about the Nicaraguan revolution, um, they could name, you know, women that participated in the revolution. But for example, when, when I watched this documentary like, like one month ago, it was quite revealing for me because I didn't have a, um, 
uh, I didn't grasp before the, the, the magnitude, the importance of women during the, the insurrection. And in that sense, for example, there are two of the most important cities in Nicaragua are Leon and Granada. Uh, perhaps, you know, so in that sense, the fact that both Dora Maria uh, Tellez and Monica Baltoano, like they guided the, the insurrection in those cities, this is impressive. And I hope that in a certain moment, people um, uh, are going to reconstruct what really happened here because it is, it is really how a, a, the, the revolutionaries, the male revolutionaries silenced this, this, uh, this truth. And it is important to rethink that uh, that revolution but what bo was both um, you know from 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 the cities and also it was guided by women so um, that will be some only something I wanted to 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 comment about the uh oh I think Sergio froze <laughs> I think we'll yes um, we can... okay I was gonna perhaps piggyback on what what Sergio was saying um I think there are a lot of different areas because there hasn't been a concerted effort to kind of like reckon with the 1980s. There's a whole lot that needs to be unpacked still. Um, one of those things, which has already been mentioned, um, but is like the role of the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the East Bloc, um, because that's turned into like a very polarized narrative where one side says, the United States was entirely behind this, and one side says, no, the, the Soviet Union was entirely behind this, or they even say it was a civil war and it wasn't a proxy war. And so the, not even the narrative itself, or like even what happened, but the narrative that comes out of this has actually been really helpful to Ortega now in framing himself positively for the Sandinistas. Um, I don't know how to explain this in a simple way. It's still something that I'm learning how to articulate. But as soon as the protests started and a lot of different organizations and a lot of national organizations started saying like Ortega is violating human rights, his immediate response was, oh, this is just a US backed coup. Yeah. And so he's inaccurately using what did happen in the 1980s now in the current context to try to excuse his own actions. And I mean, it's, having been there and having seen just thousands of pieces of evidence to the contrary, like I am 99% positive that it is not a U.S. backed skew, it is actually a civil uprising, insurrection, whatever you want to call it, um, but the people are kind of like having their say, and, and it's part of this kind of broader problem of people not attributing self-determination to people who were formerly colonized, formerly uh, I guess, I don't say victims of U.S. intervention, but you could say that, I guess. Um, but we're not really realizing that this, this climate and this landscape is changing. And so anyway, Ortega's been able to villainize this, this narrative now and use it to excuse his own human rights violations under the guise of, oh, it's just another Cold War thing. And so it's a really... <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a lot of reckoning here that, that has to be done. And I hope also, Sergio, that, that women are kind of re... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't want to go there. overboard, but I just want to add this same narrative and discourse on the victimization, just blaming everything on the U.S. intervention. It's just, just not in Nicaragua. Um, Afghanistan and Pakistan, the area where I am from, we have the same narrative. Even though our politicians are doing really grossly wrong things, but everything just goes back to what the U.S. did in, in Afghanistan. Everything just goes back to they left us high and dry. They left us to fight the Soviets and now they've abandoned us and the blame goes on the U.S., which is not entirely true. And the same is true of the discourse of human rights, which is used, uh, which dictators everywhere say, this is the U.S., this is the U.S., because the U.S. did mobilize that discourse a lot, as, as did Western Europe during the Cold War. But in fact, the International Declaration of Human Rights was not written by the U.S. And Indian uh, framers of it were particularly important. There were a lot of other people from the third world who worked on it. 
on the, uh, and you know, there are things in it that the U.S. would never have put in it, like the right to national determination, self-determination, like the right to unions, like the right to housing. I mean, this is not a U.S. document. But the history of also of women's movements receding and being pushed back and is, is common to, uh, to many other countries, Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, another similar, Bangladesh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, digging is going to need to be done to resurrect those histories. I just have a question for Meredith, if I may. Um, um, Meredith, I was wondering uh, if you could share with us how was, perhaps this would be like a lot, but I, I am curious about this. Uh, how was the experience of, of writing, um, if you compare it, uh, the, the, a, a road unforeseen with, with the rising of women, a one on a one published in 1980 and the second one in 2015 i think so how was your because in one of your answers you were comparing uh, both of them so how would you com like compare your experience in writing both of them when i wrote the rising it took me 10 years to write the rising that's partly because i was doing other things at the same time and i dropped it for a long time to do political work but um in order to get the information that I put in it, which is a lot of archival information about things that happened in the labor movement and in the socialist movement and the women's movement in the early part of the century, I had to physically go to many different archives um, and go through the papers, which is a delicious experience. I mean, because you get to see where people actually wrote their little laundry lists and everything else how much they paid for electricity, it's really interesting. But I did, I mean, I did a road unforeseen in a year. I mean, it almost killed me. It was very hard to do that. <laughs> and I felt a great sense of urgency, but it's because I could do all of the research online. It's a totally different world in terms of research. And you know, you lose something, but you gain something too, I mean. Thank you. And let me just say one other thing. I have lots of copies of this book, and I'll be glad to give one to anybody who can figure out how to get it. So we have six minutes left. Anyone has a last comment or question? If nobody else has a comment, I can say something about Nicaragua and its absurd response to COVID. <laughs> Oh, um, do tell us, tell us. So since July 2018, um, Ortega has latched on to, I'm going to say the word narrative again, but a discourse um, that everything is normal because they broke down the barricades, there were no longer kind of overt protests because they were banned. Um, they managed to crack down on all kinds of, of resistance, and so things kind of did have a pseudo-normality. So COVID, it, seem, it seems that what's happening now is that Ortega is so paranoid about losing this discourse of everything is normal that they are refusing to react to COVID. Um, and so it took, let's see, every other nation in Central America had closed their borders and enacted a quarantine by late March, I believe, if not far before that, I think most by mid-March. Whereas Ortega and his wife were still throwing 5K races, political rallies. They had a march that was called Love in Times of COVID. Um, so they've been intentionally throwing state-sanctioned activities to get enormous groups of people, thousands of people together. They've been documented mercilessly <laughs> by the press. Um, and so there is also this very interesting thing going on in Nicaragua right now because they've now had community transmission for six weeks and they're still not really documenting cases. They've only been, um, they've only confirmed 13 and of those 13, three have died. And so they have a 25% you know, 
mortality rate, but that's because they're not acknowledging any community um, spread cases. And so it's this enormous looming humanitarian disaster because there haven't been any social distancing, distancing techniques imposed and there um, continue to be none. Um, much, much in contrast to Guatemala, El Salvador, Costa Rica, all of the other F countries in the region have been um, very, very responsible and proactive about um, promoting public health in this time. But anyway, you'll probably see Nicaragua in the headlines for several reasons soon, unfortunately. So. Sorry to end on such a gloomy note. If anyone has like a happy thing to, to share, you're welcome to. I wish. Was there anyone uh, at the uh, uh, Zoom meeting, I think it was last week, uh, organized by UK on the uh, update of the COVID situation in Rojava? Yes, I was. <laughs> You joined too? Uh, right. <laughs> yes. It was like a marathon, four hours long. Right. So what useful came out of that? Discuss, uh, did you see the whole thing for four hours? Did they discuss the, uh, the work they're doing trying to 3D print ventilators? No, I dropped early. Did they discuss it? I, I don't know. But I, I, I thought that that's a great initiative that people are working on over there, that they're trying to mass produce. Yeah, have, have you seen any recent news on that? Because I've seen something a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't sure whether they're working, those ventilators. It, it's also less and less sure that ventilators are the way to treat this. this. I mean, I've been keeping up on the medical stuff as much as I can and they have disastrous consequences, at least for old people. Now some of the other hospitals are trying other things that are slightly less invasive. But I don't think they're gonna get that many ventilators, so it's not gonna be a problem, I don't know. Yeah. In any case, that uh, meeting was recorded, so we posted it on our Facebook, anyone interested? I tried to listen and I could not understand what Salam Nassim was saying. Really? <laughs> I mean, it, I had to like listen very closely, attentively, but I could, uh, I could make it out. Well, you may be better at listening to the accent than I am. I really couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Anya, what were the, the takeaways or the highlights for you? One second. Well, uh, Sally, Muslim, he did highlight you know, the UN complicity in this international state, nation state system, and that's which inhibits the region to receive the help they could receive from international bodies. There was also, but it didn't, um, the discussion wasn't confined just to COVID. They also discussed the recent initiatives uh, for the Kurdish unity, um, the, uh, this uh, ongoing um, tension and potential conflict between the PKK and the uh, parties in the Kurdish, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and how Turkey is fueling that. Uh, so they addressed a lot of stuff. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Sergio, do you have a close? Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you all for inviting me to this. No, thank you so much, Meredith and Holly. This has been really interesting. And thank you everybody for, for the discussion that we had. Um, so in perhaps we can we can think about it i don't know if right now or during the week if we can propose a reading or another documentary and with the idea of you know trying to connect like different historical moments and and you know i try to rethink women's participation but also uh, what is the concept of revolution nowadays so um thank you everybody and Shall we finish? <laughs> the... Rose, did you yes. raise your hand, Rose? Did you want to say something? I'm unmuting you.
Hi, I had one um, quick question um, for HM. What was the name of the activists you were part of that were flyering and um, about um, spreading the information about Nicaragua, Nicaragua and what was going on? Oh, okay. So there's an organization in New York and New Jersey that's called in Spanish Comité SOS in Nicaragua. Um, so SOS Committee Nicaragua. They do not have any English language materials, but there are some in the U.S. that do. Um, I can send those links if you'd like to Anya and she can spread them, I guess, or maybe. In case people are interested. There's, it's Comité, you said that's the name? Or yeah, I can send you okay. the, the linkages. Yeah, you can just post it in the chat room. Yeah. Get it from there. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye, everyone. And see you. Bye. Oh, and yeah, next Take week care. on Tuesday, we have a, a monthly meeting. Uh, if you can join us, it's also at 7 p.m. I will be sending out a reminder with the link, Zoom link. So hope to see you then. Nice to see everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everyone.